Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to um, your next science lesson. We're going to be talking about electric circuits, but before we do that, we thought we'd show you quickly how to enroll into the math, the physical science grade 10 class. So first of all, you need to go to this website here, which is www.turnable.org, and you'll come to this page. And the first time users, you need to register before login ends. You need to put down your name, your surname, and an email address, and you press it register. And then the next time you will log in, that's after you've registered, and then you just have to have your name and your password, and you can even click the remember me, which is great, because then you don't have to remember the password every time, and you press log in. So then you'll get to a page that looks like this, and it'll have choose subject, progress and results, and to enable help online, and it won't have any of these subjects in it because you won't have registered yet. So you need to press choose subject, go through all the subjects, and you will choose find mathematics grade 10, which is not what we want. We want physical science grade 10 for this lesson, so that's the one that you will choose. You will click on it, and you'll come back to the screen, and you will end up with this little blue block that says physical science grade 10. Yay! Why do we want you to do this? Well, because there are a couple of things we can do. The first thing is you won't have questions to mark. Don't worry about that. But you will have live assessments and you'll have upcoming events and you'll have messaging. So the cool thing about this is that what we want to do is after we finish each section, we would like to give live assessments. That's an online assessment you guys can go and do. There multiple, will be multiple choice. And then I will get the results. Don't worry, it's not personal results. It is group results. And then I'll say, oh, look, only 20% of the class got question two right. Then I can go look at what question two was and I can teach that. I can make sure that you guys understand that. What else can we do? Well, we can tell you about upcoming events such as this lesson and that be great because then you don't have to keep logging into Facebook or Twitter or wherever to get these um, events or get the get, get the connection to these lessons. You can just come onto this website and see when they are. Finally, if you click the upcoming events, so if you go back to this upcoming events, right, you click on that and then it'll say, for example, all the dates. So today would be um, Tuesday, 23rd of August, and it would have grade 10 physical science, and you will click the view event. When you click the view event, you'll come across a page that looks like this. And then what you do is you'll click the blue block that says open live TV link. And it'll take you to screen here. You can choose to open the feed in a new tab, that's fine. But most importantly, what you need to do is press the green button, not the sign in as event team member, it won't let you in. You need to press the green button. You press this button either to watch the live or later the recording of the show, okay? And then finally, you'll come up to the lesson, okay? And that's what you can watch. The cool thing about this is that you can message me during the lesson using that button there. You can message the me during that button by pressing that button. And what you can do is what I'd like to happen is for you guys to ask me things like um, if there's certain sections you want to go through, or if you've got questions on certain sections, then that would be ideal. And we have had that in the past where a couple of students have asked us to do certain sections that they were struggling on and then what I do is I finish the section I'm on and then I make sure the next section I cover is um, basically going to be that question that section that you've asked for. Um, okay please note that the message studio link is only active during the live session. Okay it's only active during the live session you can't message me when you're watching a recording. Okay, and that is how you enroll. You do not need to enroll to watch the videos, but obviously you get extra benefits if you do enroll, because like I say, you can communicate with us. Okay, so let's talk about electric circuits. In the last lesson, we were talking about electric circuits, and we spoke about EMF and potential difference. And we spoke about, and I'm going through this again because I wanted to show you something last week and I couldn't get the thing to run, um, which I now can, yay. So what I want 
want to do is go through this and make sure you understand how this works. And then we will go through the animation I've got. Well, the little flash player. So first of all, the definition. Potential difference is the work done per unit charge. So what did I say this was? I said was the amount of work it required to get a unit charge around a circuit. Okay, so it is the work done per unit charge and it's measured in volts. So the equation is obviously V is equal to W over Q where W is going to be the work done, V is the volts and Q is your charge. And I'm running through this quickly because we did discuss this last lesson. So the work done is joules. So remember that is the same as energy. So you can either say it's the energy required or the work done per unit charge. Your charge is measured in coulombs and your potential difference is volts. Right now, I want to discuss the difference between EMF and potential difference. And I've just shown, I've just taken a screenshot of the website that I'm using. If you want to ever find any nice simulations that you guys can help you understand things, and I'll show you what I mean by that, then go Google PHET. It's a website run by the University of Colorado, and it is really, really good. And it's got a whole bunch of different simulations. So sometimes if you're struggling to understand something, it can really help to work through simulation. So let me give you an example of this. This is the thing that I wanted to show you guys last week. Okay, so what I've got is a very, very, very simple um, circuit. Okay, I have got some wires here. We've got two cells to make this a battery. And I have got a switch. And this is a light bulb. And these little things here are supposed to be the electrons. Okay, and yeah, we've got a voltmeter. Okay, now I wanted to show you the difference between EMF and a voltmeter. I mean, EMF and potential difference. So first of all, just let me show you why this is cool. First of all, obviously you can bring anything of these in and you can put it in schematic. So that's what it would look like. Okay. Or you can make it lifelike. I kind of like lifelike. You can also bring in an ammeter. Okay, but I'm choosing not to. I just like my vault music because that's what I want to use. So last week when I was busy explaining this to you, I was saying that EMF is the maximum voltage that a cell can provide a circuit. So if I put my voltmeter across here, do you see that it's measuring 18 volts? Okay, 18 volts. Um, I just want to see if I've included internal resistance. Um, Okay, right. Now look what happens when I close my circuit. When Let's just move this first. When I close my circuit, first of all, do you see that the electrons are moving around the circuit? Okay, and you will notice that the electrons are actually traveling from the negative end of the battery through to the positive end of the battery because this is the real flow. Okay, and obviously the light bulb shines up. Now if I put my voltmeter across here, do you see that it's now measuring, let's try again, it's now measuring 17.999 volts compared to when the switch was open when it was 18 volts. Um, and that's basically because I've given it very little um, internal resistance. So let's try again and there we go, 17.637. Okay, so that shows you that there is internal resistance inside the voltmeter. So what are we doing? We're saying that, oopsie, sorry, I can never find the switch. Okay, there we go. At the moment, this voltmeter is reading the maximum voltage that this can provide the circuit, okay? The minute I open the circuit, you will see that the voltage has gone down. And now it is measuring what? The, the battery is actually supplying the circuit. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm saying that your EMF, and stupidly I didn't leave enough space for me to write, the EMF is the maximum voltage the battery or cell can supply the circuit. Okay. Whereas the potential difference is the volts that are actually supplied 
to the circuit. And last week, I actually explained this to you. I said to you that remember that you had a cell and then a very basic cell and you would have a core, usually it's graphite, but it could be anything. And then there would be this mixture, solution mixture around it, an electrolyte with chemicals in it. And what would happen is electrons would have to go around. Yeah, that looks like a tree. Um, hang on. <laughs> okay, wait. Let me draw an actual light bulb and not a tree. So um, I have to say, I admit that I will never ever win awards for my art. So let's try again. And then we, and then dish, 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 dish. Okay, so it's going around like this, okay? And the electrons are going from the negative end through to the positive end, okay? That's what the electrons are doing. And remember I said to you that the problem was that this year, provides resistance, okay? And the more electrons we're trying to get through here, the faster they're trying to get through, not only the more, but the faster they're trying to get through, the greater the internal resistance. And that's what causes the difference between the EMF and the potential difference. So the EMF is what the voltmeter measures, and it's the maximum voltage the battery can supply the circuit, or maximum potential energy, whereas the potential difference is what's actually supplied to the circuit. Okay, so when there's no current flow, the circuit is involved in the measures the EMF. This is the maximum voltage of the cell battery can supply the circuit, okay? When the circuit is closed, the current flows, as we saw, and the voltmeter measures the terminal potential difference, which is the actual volt supplied to the circuit. And the difference between these two is called the last volts, okay? So what's important about that is that the last volts Okay, so we're going to write that. So basically, we've got the EMF is equal to the volts across the battery plus the last volts, um, V last. Okay, and this would be the V of the circuit. Right, now, so an example, a voltage of 6 volts is applied to a circuit to move 300 coulombs of charge. How much energy was required? And remember I said to you that the work done is measured in joules. And remember last week I said to you that this is the same unit as energy. So we could either talk about energy being used or the work being done. So the equation, which is on your formula sheet, is V is equal to W over Q, where V, and let's always write it down, V, W, and Q. Your V is your volts, which you're given at six. Your coulombs is Three or charge is 300 coulombs, and then they want the W, okay, and then they want the W. So what do we do? We multiply both sides by Q. This cancels with this, and we end up with VQ equals W. So then it goes 6 times 300 equals 1800, and what's important is the unit. You must include your unit. Therefore, the amount of energy needed to move these charges is 1800 joules. Okay, not too difficult, eh? Right, now we need to talk about current. So current is defined as the rate of flow of charge. In other words, it's a measure of how much charge passes a certain point in one second. Okay, so let's think about this. Your volts is a measure of how much energy energy or work done is required to move a charge. I mean, that's basically what it's saying. Okay, if we just had to paraphrase it. The current is a measure of how quickly it travels, how much charge passes a certain point in one second. So I is the symbol for current, Q is again the symbol for charge, and T is time. And the current is always measured in amperes, and that's a capital A. Charge is measured in coulombs, and time is measured in seconds. And grade tens, you do not write that. 
really this it's just wrong okay you do not write that you can either write an s or if you get a little confused and you get tempted to write that write the whole word out okay so your options for time are s or seconds okay not the sex thing okay so please be careful of this so we can therefore see if i is equal to q over t then we know that it's going to be q is measured in charge over time which is seconds which can be written as coulombs per second so one ampere is the same as one coulomb per second okay right so now let's try this question it says what current passes through a lamp if 30 coulombs of charge flows in five seconds okay so this is pretty easy again and like i keep saying to you guys always write down your variables okay and then see what you got and admittedly at the moment because we're doing this section we know that we're using this equation but when you're in exam or test situation you get given this question and then the teacher doesn't nicely give you the equation you're going to use you have to work out what you're going to use so the best thing to do is write down the variables that you've got and then go look on your formula sheet and see if there's a formula that get, helps you get or solve your problem for you okay because that's kind of what you're thinking to do okay so it says what current so they want to know the current passes through lamp if 30 coulombs 30 coulombs of charge flows in five seconds okay so we want i we've got q and we've got t so we're going to look at our formula sheet and we say oh look there is this beautiful formula that says i is equal to q over t the next thing you want to do before you even carry on with this is you want to check whether these are SI units. Is this in coulombs? Yes, it is. Is the time in seconds? Yes, it is. Awesome. Now we can substitute in. So it's going to be Q, which is 30 divided by 5, which is 6. And then what you always have to do, you always have to put your units in. So it's 6 amperes. Nice and easy. Hey, now. We, I kind of have mentioned this to you already and remember grade 10, this is a revision lesson because you should know most of this from um, grade 9, grade 8 and grade 9 and um, some of this, okay, you don't necessarily need to have known about the volts and you don't need to know um, about the, the, the I equals Q over T, but this you should know and that is that what happened was long time ago in a galaxy far far away and no, i'm kidding long time ago they used to say that current was they used to think that everything that flowed was positive so they figured that blood flowed around our body and from a positive to a negative everything moved from positive to negative okay um so what happened was that when they realized that electricity flowed, then they said, okay, fine, it's obviously flowing from the positive end of the battery to the negative end of the battery. And then many years later, so what happened was, okay, so everybody thought, right, electricity flows from the positive to the negative end of the battery. So they made all their rules based on that, okay? The rules that you'll learn about later, the right-hand wire rule, the left-hand motor rule, the right-hand dynamo rule, you name it. They've decided, they worked on the fact that electricity flowed from the positive end of the battery to the negative end of the battery. Okay, and then later on, Someone went along and they looked at the electricity that was flowing and they realized that the electrons were moving and the electrons are moving from the negative end of the battery to the positive end of the battery. So if we go back to my little simulation, yeah. Okay, let's see if I can make this bigger. Uh, woo, okay. And then let's see if I can make it, how do I move this around now? Okay, let's make it small. Okay. <laughs> okay, right. And let's say I want to look at just this bit. How do I want to just look at that bit? Oh, there we go. Let's look. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, let's just put it back in and put it in and remove the voltmeter. Let's just join these two up. There we go. And let's remove the voltmeter. Gone. And let's say that. If you look carefully, you can see that this is the positive end of the battery and this is the negative end of the battery. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can get it bigger again. It won't actually let me get to the battery. Oh, it's very frustrating. Okay, right. So now, oh, there's a better way. 
If you look at the schematic, you guys know that the long end of the battery is the positive and the short end of the battery is the negative. So what you need to realize is that these electrons are flowing from the negative to the positive, from the negative around the circuit to the positive, okay? So again, if we look at the life like, you can see that they're going from the negative to the positive, okay? So what is actually happening is that the real current travels from the negative end of the battery battery to the positive end of the battery. So the electron flow is this way, okay? And the reason is, and I kind of mentioned this last week as well, is that the positive, when the circuit is closed, when the switch closes, this positive end forms, sucks in a little electron and it forms a gap. So then a little electron has to fill that and then that forms a gap and then it forms a little chain reaction and then all the little electrons move around exactly like we just saw in the animation, right? So what happens is the electrons are actually being produced from the negative end and, which, and it's negative because it's got an excess of electrons, right? Excess of electrons. That's why it's negative. And this is positive because it doesn't have enough of electrons. It's got a deficit not enough electrons, deficit of electrons. So basically we're going from the negative to the positive, but then that meant that all our rules were long, wrong. The left-hand motor rule, the right-hand dynamo rule, the um, everything, the right-hand wire rule, everything was wrong. So they decided, nope, they're not going to change all those rules. They're just going to call the direction that we assumed the electricity was traveling in as being conventional. And conventional just means by rule, by rule. So in other words, they said, okay, from now on, we're going to say by convention or by, like, by, by agreement, okay, the electricity, the current is going to flow from the positive terminal to the battery to the negative terminal. So whenever they ask you to draw a circuit, okay, and they ask you to draw the, con they ask you to draw the conventional current flow, you will draw it from the positive to the negative end of the battery. But you guys, just as much as you know that weight is a force with which you're attracted and not what you've measured in, in kilograms, okay, you guys will know that the electron flow is actually from the negative end of the battery to the positive end. But when you speak to people that haven't done science and they talk about current flow, we are talking about from the positive end to the negative end, and that is defined as the conventional current. So like I said, the real current is also called the electron flow, and it's always in the direction that the electrons actually flow so from a negative terminal to the positive terminal. So there is a little picture to explain to you what I've just said. Okay. Right, now let's talk about ammeters and voltmeters. And again, this is revision. You guys should know this stuff, okay? Ammeters are instruments that are used to measure the current in the circuit. Okay, so they are used to measure the rate, okay, the rate at which the electrons are flowing around the circuit, okay? And in other words, flowing around the circuit. And then other words, they're measuring how fast. Because whenever you see rate, you think, need to think, divide by time, okay? They've got very low resistance and therefore are connected in series, okay? They're connected in series, but their resistance is so low that they don't actually mess with the current at all. Okay, so now let's talk about resistance. So we've spoken about voltmeters. We know that voltmeters got a high resistance and therefore they were connected in parallel. We've spoken about ammeters having low resistance, always connected in series. Now let's talk about resistors. Now resistors slow down the flow of charge and they oppose the flow of charge, okay? So they can be anything. They can be light bulbs, they can be heaters, toasters, basically everything that except for ammeters, everything that you connect in, and batteries, even batteries got resistance, everything that you connect into circuit has got some form of resistance. Okay, the symbol for resistance is an R, and the unit of resistance is, is ohm. Okay, it's the Greek letter for omega. This here is a symbol for it. It's a Greek letter omega, which you can just draw like that. Okay, and basically it's devi defined as the volt per ampere volts per ampere and later on 
you'll learn a bit more about Ohm's law, which proves this, okay? So it's defined as the volt per ampere. So let me just write that. So R is equal to V I over I, okay? And that's actually Ohm's law. So this was a Mr. Ohm that went along and did that. Okay, right, moving on. So how does resistance come about? Okay, basically the electrons move through the conductor colliding with the particles in the conductor. Remember we said to you that in your metal, you've got these metal nuclei, and then we've got these C of D localized electrons. C of D localized electrons. And I have explained to you that what happens is that these electrons will carry on traveling in their orbitals around their specific atoms, but because these orbitals are all at the same energy level, that if you put a current across them, then these electrons will be able to be moving from the negative end of the battery to the positive end of the battery across the piece of wire and they'll do it because if all of these let's just show you yeah these are the overlapping orbitals right so if i've got an electron uh, let's say this is the positive end of the battery and this is the negative end of the battery i have an electron it can flow along like this okay depending on where the other electrons are around these actual specific atoms but now as they move the, through the conductor, obviously there's not just one little electron that is traveling through, there are hundreds of them, thousands of them. So they collide with the particles in the conductor. And when they collide, they transfer kinetic energy. Okay, they transfer. Remember, 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 energy is never lost nor gained. It's only transferred from one form to another. So energy, I'm gonna write it down, it's so important. Energy is never Last, nor gained, it's only transferred from one form to another. So what we're saying is that when they collide, when these particles collide, let's say there's another particle over here and it's screaming along, la 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 la, and it gets to, oopsie, and it hits that one over there. Okay, so when it does that, it loses kinetic energy. Well, it doesn't lose it, sorry, it transfers kinetic energy. And these electrons therefore slow down. And the kinetic energy is transferred to heat. Now, you guys know if you're using your cell phone or your laptop or your iPad or your iPod or whatever you've got, you can know that you use it a lot, okay, and it will get warm, it'll get hot. And the reason it's getting hot is because of the transfer of electrons and the fact that as electricity travels through, some resistance builds up because of the fact that these, well, heat builds up because of the fact that there's resistance in the wire. Okay, and that's one of the reasons why all our laptops and computers and that have fans to cool down their motherboard and the whole, um, body of the laptop and the computer is because we do not want the computer to overheat. Okay, and the reason they would is because of this resistance. So now factors that affect resistance are the length, thickness, temperature and type and we need to talk about them. Okay, so obviously this one's pretty obvious, okay. The longer the wire, okay, the longer the wire, the greater the resistance. And that makes sense because the longer the wire, the further the electrons have to travel, right? And the further the electrons have to travel, the more likelihood that they're going to be colliding with other particles and other electrons and transferring their energy from kinetic energy into heat energy, et cetera, et cetera, and slowing down. So therefore the length makes sense. Thickness. Now, you need to think about traffic when you think about thickness, because thickness is interesting. And it's the thicker the wire, the lower the resistance, the lower the resistance. Okay. 
think about this. It makes sense. If you're traveling, let's say you're traveling along and you've in three lane traffic, okay? And there's cars all the way along on this three lane traffic. And let's say then suddenly the council have decided to block off one of these lanes of traffic because they've decided they need to repair it at peak hour. I don't know. So suddenly all the cars that were in the third lane have to fit in with the second lane. I mean with these other two lanes. So they've got to fit in there. So do you agree that what happens? You end up with this being much slower and what happens is it becomes more difficult to get through. So the thinner the wire, the more difficult it is for the electrons to transfer through and therefore the higher the resistance. So similarly, or obviously then the thicker the wire, the more lanes we have for our traffic, you can think of it that way, the lower the resistance, the more atoms, the electrons have to go around to be able to get out. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about temperature. Now, temperature is an interesting one. People often think, well, if we heat stuff up, things happen faster, right? We know that if we think chemicals and chemistry, we know that if we heat it up, then it happens faster. But when it comes to wires, chemical temperature is interesting. Let's think of it this way. Okay, let's pretend we've got a piece of wire and let's pretend that it's exactly one atom thick. Okay, let's get real, it's not gonna happen, but let's pretend. So we've got one atom thick, okay? Now, if I suddenly put a charge across it, this is positive and that is negative, what's going to happen? We're going to have a little bit of an electron flow coming through from the negative to the positive. It's going to go la, 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 maybe up here, maybe down here. Remember, it's three-dimensional, so it can go across and out. Awesome. Now, let's heat this wire Okay, now you've got to understand that this is actually, the metals actually form a type of lattice. Okay, they have a lattice. So the, all the little atoms, it's not a crystal lattice, there's not big spaces between the atoms, obviously not, they actually overlap each other, which is why the orbitals overlap. But what I'm saying is that they're packed nicely together, okay? Now what happens is we heat it up. So before we heated it up, all these atoms were vibrating. Vibrating on the spot. Now we heat it up. What happens to these electrons? Suddenly these atoms are moving. They're jiggling around. Okay. And maybe this three, yeah, whatever. They're jiggling around. And they are now moving. And because they've got a lot more energy, they're moving around. And this, obviously, my diagram is only showing one dimensional movement. I'm just showing it moving from left to right. You can understand that as soon as I start heating this up, these atoms are going to start moving left and right and up and down and forward and backwards three dimensionally, right? All the way around. So what happens are now I put a charge across it. Okay, let's make a positive on this side and a minus on this side. So the electron gets pulled off of this one, right? So therefore, the electrons do agree they can go la 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 and solve the problem. Now there's a problem here. This little atom has an absence of an electron. It's positively charged. It wants another electron from this atom. But this atom, this dude here, he's having a, such a party because he's got so much energy from being heated up. He's maybe traveling this way. So what has to happen? This atom has to wait for this atom to travel back, bounce into it, and when it bounces into it, then it can pull the electron off. So actually, what actually happens is that the greater the temperature, the greater the temperature, the higher the resistance. The greater the temperature, the higher the resistance when it comes to electricity and wires and things like that. Another reason why you don't want your computer to be overheating and getting hot. Okay, so the greater the temperature, the greater the resistance. And finally, type. Okay, there's not much we can do about this. Some materials are just much better resistors, I mean, conductors of electricity than others. So, for example, all our um, conducting wires are generally made of copper. And the reason for that is because they are very good conductors 
of electricity. So it really depends, okay? It's just like some things burn better than others. Some metals are better conductors of electricity. And yes, we can get into why and everything, but you don't have to know that for grade 10. Okay, so those are the factors that affect resistance, length, thickness, temperature, and type. And grade 10s, you need to know this. You need to be able to list it and explain every single one of them for the exams, okay? Right, let's carry on. So now let's talk about resistors in series. Okay, this is when we add resistors one after the other in a circuit. Okay, now I want to draw this for you. So let's talk about resistors in series. So here we go. I'm going to draw something for you. We've got a little battery. And then I'm going to put an ammeter here. I'm going to call it ammeter one. And then I'm going to put a resistor. One and a resistor two. Okay, you know what? I actually realized that I can actually show you this using the little simulation that I've got. So let's just um, reset all. Okay, right. So let's say I've got a wire and I've got a battery and another battery. And then let's put a wire here. I wonder if it'll let me put an ammeter. There you go, ammeter. Okay, there's an ammeter. And then I've got a wire. And then just for fun, instead of a resistor, I'm gonna put a light bulb. Okay, and then let's put another wire. And let's put another ammeter. We I need more space. And we can shorten these wires. Okay. And let's just shorten it a bit more. And then put another, um, take a break. And then I'm going to put another wire in. And put another ammeter in. I mean, put another light bulb. And then put another wire. Up we go. Yeah, man. Up we go. And then, you know what, I'm actually going to, it's fine, and put another ammeter in. Okay, and that's not very neat at all. Okay, but now, what I wanted to show you is this, <laughs> which I'm going to just, um, how do I do this? Right click and split junction. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got a circuit that is totally a series circuit. In other words, the resistors, and in this case, my resistors are actually my light bulbs. My light bulbs are acting as resistors. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I just want to connect this back up. What happened to my switch? Oh, there it is. Um, I'm going <laughs> to. Sorry, I'm laughing because it just disappeared. There we go. And let's move it. Okay, let's not be like that then. There we go. And let's connect it back up. Okay, so now we've got the circuit. And you can see that we have got our batteries and we've got our ammeters. Okay, now what you need to understand is that this ammeter is measuring the rate at which the electrons are flowing around the circuit. So electrons are going to come through here and they're going to go through the ammeter. Now remember the ammeter has a very low resistance, very low resistance. So because of that, it is actually going to not actually affect the rate of the electrons whatsoever. Okay, so I can actually then close the switch and you will see that the electrons flowing around and you will notice something. Do you notice that the current is the same in every single one of these resistors? I mean, between them. So the current here, which is flowing in the main circuit, is the same as the current between these resistors, which is the same as the current between these resistors. Okay, does everybody understand that? Now, if I have to take my switch and open it, and let's take another wire and connect it from here, and let's connect it. We're going to cut out this amide. We're cutting out this. Okay, let's just split this. Um, 
Okay, so what I've done is this is no longer part of the circuit. The circuit is now going, in fact, let's just move this as well. Um, remove and then put another one here. Let's do that. Hmm, I don't know why they keep disappearing. Come on. There we go. So now this part of the circuit doesn't exist anymore. Now let's look at what happens to the ammeter reading. Do you agree that we now have only got one little light bulb okay, in the circuit and we've got an ammeter before it, we have an ammeter over here and we have an ammeter over here. So the theory goes that since the ammeters measuring the rate at which the electrons are going around the circuit and they don't affect anything, these measurements should actually be more or less the same. But what should happen to the overall rate? Okay, look at that, 1.8 amperes. So do you see that the rate of the electrons are going much further, the rate of the electrons is much higher, the current is much higher, and that is because we've got fewer light bulbs in the circuit. Okay, I'm going to prove it to you again by just opening this and we're going to remove this, delete, and we're going to connect this back up. Okay, and then close this. Okay, and you can see here that again, we can see that the current is the same throughout the circuit. Okay, current is the same throughout the circuit, but obviously it's lower now because now we've got two light bulbs. And what you should have noticed as well is that what you should have noticed as well is that that is this that's now half okay the current is now half it was 1.8 when i only had one light bulb now i've got two light bulbs and it is now 0.9 amps also please notice the brightness do you look at the brightness now okay now i'm going to move this down and i'm going to cheat and bring this in and i'm going to go across it okay do you see that we basically got rid of this now okay what happens is electricity is really lazy okay it's always going to choose the path of least resistance okay it's going to go through the section that's got the least amount of current so this wire has got no resistance in it so electrons are going to travel through this wire rather than go through that resistor okay so note now that we've effectively cut out this part of the circuit and this light bulb look how bright this car the light bulb is so the bright of the lightness brightness of the light, light bulb is actually double and the current is double okay well we don't know if it's double but it's definitely brighter okay whereas if i take this bit here and i delete it there we go it's dimmer and we've got half the current okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to love and leave you at the end of, with at this point at the beginning of next lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to come back to this and I'm going to show you what the voltmeter reading is and what the voltmeter readings do and then we're going to make a summary of all that. Right, I hope that you've learned a bit more than you did before about electricity and we will continue about electricity and electric circuits and then do parallel circuits next lesson, which is on Thursday. Have a great day.